Whatever's going on out there in Iran and in the Middle East? America, are they going to go to war with Iran? Is there going to be a nuclear holocaust? Is Iran going to push back against America by attacking Israel? You know, Jesus said that just before he comes back, men's hearts will fail them for fear, worrying whatever is going to happen to the earth. But the long-term message is good, that Jesus is going to come back, and it seems very soon, to establish the kingdom of God here on the earth. And those who have connected with Jesus, who are baptized into him, who have risen with him in resurrection, will rise from the dead, and will live eternally in God's kingdom here on the earth. That's the ultimate good news out of all this. But in the short term, all the same, we live here in secular lives in a secular world. And it seems that man is, is lost, that nobody really knows what on earth is going to happen. And yet, actually, the things that are going on out there in the Middle East are spoken about in the Bible. Yes, Iran is in the Bible, called Persia, or sometimes called Elam. So I want to go through with you some of the things that the Bible says about the destiny of Iran in God's purpose. Well, let's start with Daniel chapter 2. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, you've got the answer to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon's natural worry and fear about what's going to happen in the future. And he's given a, a dream which Daniel interprets, and it's a dream of a great statue and he's the head of gold the king of babylon is the head of gold and there's breast and arms of silver belly and thighs of brass two legs of iron and feet part of iron part of clay and a little stone cut out from a mountain without hands hits the image on the feet destroys it becomes a big mountain and lasts forever the idea is that the little stone ultimately is the lord jesus coming to this earth destroying the kingdoms of men and establishing God's kingdom on the earth. Well, let's go through it in a bit more detail. After Babylon, there came Medo-Persia, the belly, uh, sorry, the uh, breast and the arms of silver, and then the Greeks, the belly and thighs of brass, the two legs of iron, the two parts of the Roman Empire, and the, the east and the west. But all these powers, we're told, would dominate the earth. Now clearly that's not talking about the whole planet. None of those empires govern the whole planet. The Hebrew word Eretz refers, I suggest, very often specifically to the land promised to Abraham from Egypt to the Euphrates River. And so those nations who had historically dominated Israel God's land are the nations that are in view, but the image stands complete in the last days because the little stone, that's Jesus, comes to the earth and destroys the whole thing and the wind comes and blows it all away and God's kingdom is established forever. What that means is that all those empires, entities, etc., who historically dominated Israel must also do so in some last day domination of Israel. That means that there will be some entity that will stand upon the land of Israel and dominate it in the last days and then be destroyed by the coming of Jesus. Now, Persia, or Iran, was historically one of those components. So, just focusing on Iran for the moment, forgetting the, the, other, the other empires, Iran is going to have some part in dominating Israel in the last days, but will be destroyed by the coming of Jesus. And then all this stuff is over and the kingdom of God will be established on this earth. So, we're worried about a war between Iran and America. America prods Iran. Iran's got to prod back, it's just the way people are. And how does Iran prod back? Are they, are they going to go and bomb New York City? Well, maybe, but the historical response of Iran to American provocation, as they see it, is to hit at Israel. At Israel, 
who historically have been supported by America. You hit my kids, you, you hit my friends, you're hitting me. That's, that's the idea. And so, well, why then has Israel survived since 1948 as a nation? It's surrounded by enemies far more populous than them when they've got Islamic theology that's followed by, by extremists uh, calling for a jihad, a holy war to destroy Israel. How has Israel survived so long? Well, because the West, basically America in particular, have sort of been the foil against all that surrounding aggression, particularly from Iran. But that's got to stop because in the end, the Bible is very clear that Israel will be overrun by her enemies, it seems briefly, leading them to repentance to accept the Lord Jesus and then he returns. So that Western kind of foil that's, that's holding back an invasion of Israel by her enemies, particularly Iran, that has somehow got to finish. Now, that could finish in a number of ways. Talk about a war between Iran and America and everyone assumes that America's going to win. Well, you know, David killed Goliath, right? Uh, not necessarily. You know, upsets happen. The big guy doesn't always win, especially these days where who dares wins with your technology, with your vision, etc. It's not, you know, man against man and thousands of people fighting in trenches. That's not the way things are done. Or it could simply be time and tide. The tide of human history has turned against the West. It is turning against the West. Everyone has their day and Rome must fall just as Athens fell before it and so forth and just as Babylon fell before that. So time and tide may take its course and the West loses its power, etc. Or it could be a growing pro-Islamic and anti-Israel sentiment takes over as it's taken over here in the, in the European Union. So you're going to see that happening in the longer term in, in America and United Kingdom and so forth. Maybe. Whatever. But that foil that's holding back the desire clearly of Iran and the nations around Israel to wipe Israel off the map and to stand upon that land as their land, as they see it, the land of Islam, the land of the Prophet, Muhammad, etc., as they see it. Well, that foil is going to be taken away. How it's going to be taken away, we don't know. It could be a war between Iran and America. Iran basically wins in the sense that they, they, they stop America being involved further. Who knows? It could simply be threats and partial victory, etc. That means that the West thinks, look, we're just pulling out of the Middle East. This whole thing has just been an absolute stone around our necks. Let Israel have its, its fate. Well, the Bible is focused upon the land promised to Abraham. And there are within that land a number of nations who, it seems to me, will come together to be a latter-day beast. It's called the beast of the earth or the beast of the land in the book of Revelation. But you also read in Revelation 13 about a beast that comes out of the sea and these are two different beasts. Now you've got to remember when you're reading apocalyptic, that is the, these Bible prophecies that you've got here, and in Revelation particularly, that you are reading apocalyptic. You've got to understand the genre that you're reading. The cosmology, that the worldview of the Hebrew writers was that, as it were, Israel was the earth, the land, surrounded by the sea of Gentile nations. So out of the land promised to Abraham, the earth, yep, there arises a beast, yep, Places like Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Syria, Iraq, where ISIS uh, or whoever is going to follow ISIS, Islamic State, are operating. Yes, sure. That I can see. But what about this beast of the sea? Well, the sea, again, understanding their cosmology, was the area immediately around the earth, surrounded the, the land. So I think it refers to the nations immediately on the borders of the land promised to Abraham. 
Who are those nations? Iran. They're not in the land promised to Abraham. They're the other side of the Euphrates, but they're right on the border. Iran, Turkey, Egypt, North Africa, etc. These are the, the nations of the sea, as it were, that surround the land of Israel in prophetic terms. When you come to Ezekiel chapter 38, you have there ten nations who are around Israel and they're listed in terms of their, their compass points. So you've got Gomer and Tagama from the north, Persia, that's Iran, on the east, Cush from the south, Put and Tarshish from the west. And these nations are going to come, led by a charismatic individual called Gog, an individual called Gog, who is going to lead them in an invasion of Israel that is destroyed by the Lord Jesus. So Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them, verse 5, are going to come. The house of Tagama from the uttermost parts of the north. Well, this is north of the land of Israel. In other words, as I say, these are the nations around the land promised to Abraham. You can look for ultimately Turkey, Iran, Egypt, maybe Saudi in the, in the south, getting together. And uh, as I say, should you go to work on Monday? You know, is Jesus going to come back on Monday? Well, I, I, I'm not, I think that's facile and simplistic to say, look, get on the edge of your seat, Jesus is about to come. He probably will come very soon. And he may come before I finish doing this talk. But, but, I think it's simplistic to, to try to force current events into Bible prophecy. But, on the other hand, what I'm saying is that the situation that you're seeing developing there in the Middle East right at this moment is really ticking a lot of boxes from the prophets and it is starting to come together. Yes, the nations within the land promised to Abraham, that is from Egypt up to the, up to the river Euphrates. Yes, yeah, sure, there's huge turmoil in the earth, in the land. And yep, you can see that may come together against Israel. But in talking about Iran, that's just outside the land promised to Abraham. That's just the other side of the Euphrates. That is all part of this beast of the sea, these ten nations of Ezekiel 38 around the land, immediately bordering upon it. So, yeah, is Iran going to focus upon Israel? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're going to focus on Israel. What provokes them to do that? Well, it could be radical Islamic jihad theology that is moving more and more because theology develops and Islamic theology develops, developing more and more to seeing the temple area, the temple mount, as being actually the most significant part of Islamic theology, even more than Mecca. They want the whole of Jerusalem, not just part of it, they want the whole of it. They want to get the entity known as Israel off the map. That's quite clear what they want to do. But what else provokes them? It could be America provoking Iran. Absolutely it could be. So that they think, well, we're not going to go and attack uh, New York City. It's a bit of a long way to go. Probably not going to get too far. Let's smash Israel. Yep, that would make sense from, from it, Iran's point of view. It would tick a lot of their boxes and it would absolutely fulfill these Bible prophecies. And the point is the next step is the coming of Jesus. That's the point. And although, I'm, as I say, I go to work on Monday, sure. Don't say, uh, he's coming, the Lord's back at the, this weekend. No, let's hope so. But all the same, we are realistically seeing the whole thing coming together. Well, when you look at what the Bible says about Persia, and also Elam, which is another name for Persia, there's an emphasis there upon their archery, that is their use of bows. So look at Jeremiah 49. Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. In other words, their bow is their might. Their bow and arrows. 
And again, Isaiah 22, verse 6, you've got the same. That Elam is known for its bows and its arrows and its quivers full of arrows. These Old Testament prophets were speaking in the language of their day, but I do really think that all this talk about bows and arrows connected with Persia and connected with Elam is talking ultimately about missiles. You look at Iran's military position, they've invested very little in their air force. They have a very small air force, relatively speaking, but, but they've put their investment and development and technology into missiles. These are the equivalent of bows and arrows, and that is why we're told in Ezekiel 38 about this latter-day invasion that Persia's involved in, that God says, I will, I will smite your bow and arrow out of your hand, and here I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. That is what they depended upon. So, when you put the names of the various Iranian missiles, just go on the Wikipedia if you doubt what I'm saying. Now, there's a couple of articles there on Wikipedia about Iranian missiles and the Iranian military capacity and so forth. You'll see that they have a, a huge, unusually wide range of missiles. This is what they are going to use and already are using and they're going to use this against Israel. Not only have they got offensive missiles, they've got pretty well-developed defensive missile systems, anti-aircraft batteries and so forth, that effectively, like Israel, have tried to do, make an iron dome over their country to protect them from other missiles landing on them. And so that is equivalent to a shield. And time and again, we're told their shield will be taken away and their bow and arrow destroyed. That which they trusted in, the power of their might. I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. That is what they depended upon, what they were well known for. So then, you can see how it's all coming together. All this talk of Iranian missiles. Yeah, exactly. Iranian missiles. This is the whole thing, that these are the equivalent of the bows and arrows and the quiver and the dome or shield of defense, which Persia and Elam are known for in the Bible. Well, don't think that God hates Iran or Persian people. Not at all. This is not how it is. God does not, in that sense, hate any ethnic group. He is not a, a racist, if you like. It's not that he's got a, a number against certain, certain ethnic groups. Not at all. There's a lovely bit at the end of this prophecy where God has just said here in Jeremiah 49 about, I will break the bow of Elam. He goes on to say, and I will set my throne in Elam. In other words, one day Elam, Persia, will be in the kingdom of God. And I will restore the fortunes of Elam in the last days, says God. So that it is not God's intention to destroy anybody. Those who, of course, curse his people shall be cursed. That is how it is. That is the law of, of spiritual life. But it is God's desire to save. And I love the way he finishes off here, that his throne will be there, that those lands will be one day in God's kingdom. And you and I can be there. Absolutely. In all earnestness, I, I say this to you, that you and I can live forever. You and I can be there in this kingdom of God that God is going to establish. But we must repent. We must accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So I urge you, study the scriptures. We've got an app that you can get. Look up Bible Companion. On, on the App Store, on, on, on Google, Google Play, you can get it. Download it. Go through the lessons there. Get baptised into Jesus. Contact us. We'll try to help you through that journey. And do not fear. Fear not, little flock. The Lord Jesus says, because it is your Father's good pleasure. It's his will. It's his desire to give you the kingdom. 